Hello, welcome to the NourishCaveman.com, where Vivica Menegaz, certified technician in Whole Foods Nutrition, presents Nutrition in the Kitchen. Good morning, everybody. Today, for Nutrition in the Kitchen, who moved out of the kitchen and is now in my office <laughs> because of um, the nature of these interviews that I'm doing, I think this is a better scenario. But this morning, I'm really excited, really, really excited to bring you a wonderful guest with a huge wealth of knowledge. And it's Dr. Jason Fung. He's a kidney specialist from Toronto and he runs a full-time practice called Intensive Dietary Management, and that is the name of his website as well. You can find the link in the blog post. And he's also the author of the awesome book, The Obesity Code. So welcome, Dr. Fang. I am very yeah. happy to have you here today. Thank you for being um, on Nutrition in the Kitchen with me. And I have a lot of questions for you today. <laughs> Well, thanks for having me. I'm glad to be here. So today's topic that I would like to discuss with Dr. Fung is insulin resistance and um, a little bit tied also into leptin resistance. And that's really one of his field of expertise. And this morning, I just happened to serendipitously read his latest blog post, which was on a different model of insulin resistance. And that is very, very interesting, and it resonated a lot with me. Dr. Fung, can you tell us um, kind of quickly what is that about, and like how did you come, you know, what's the old model of how insulin resistance works physiologically, and what is the model you propose um, for how that works? Yeah, and this is, I think, very important to understanding kind of uh, how we treat people as well. So. What insulin resistance is, so insulin is a hormone that's released when we eat. So most foods contain a combination of carbohydrates, proteins, and fats. Mm -hmm. And the protein and the carbohydrate particularly stimulate insulin. So as we eat, what happens is that the hormone insulin is uh, released. The job of insulin is to really take that food energy and store it inside our bodies. So several things happen. One thing is that the body's... Um, cells are opened up to glucose. So the glucose, which is part of the carbohydrates that we eat, are now available to power our muscles and the liver and our whole body basically, right? Mm -hmm. So that's one of its main jobs is to move the glucose from the blood, which we've eaten now. We've eaten it. It's gotten into our blood. Now the muscles take up this glucose. The liver takes up the glucose and uses that for energy. That's its normal job, okay? When we don't eat, that's uh, fasting. So uh, fasting simply means that it's uh, any time you're not eating, you're fasting, right? That's the definition. It's just the flip side of eating. As you fast, your insulin levels start to fall, and that's the signal that we need to start moving some of the food energy that we store back out. And this is a normal process. So, for instance, if you eat breakfast at 7 and dinner at 7, so you're, you're eating during from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m., and you're fasting from 7 p.m. to 7 a.m., for example. Mm -hmm. So during that time, you're storing food energy uh, in the day as you're eating. And during the night, you don't just you know drop dead. You store that food energy, you take that food energy, and bring it back out for the cells. Right. <laughs> so what insulin resistance refers to is the fact that the glucose, which is in the blood, doesn't get into the cell. Okay. Mm -hmm. And because the job of insulin is to move that glucose from the blood into the cell, we say that the cell is now resistant to the action of mm -hmm. insulin. Mm -hmm. And the question is what causes this insulin resistance? And that causes high blood sugar, right? So once the, exactly. the glucose is not taken up into the cell, that brings our blood sugar levels to get higher and higher. And exactly. we connect that with diabetes too because that's a problem of high blood sugar. Right? Exactly. exactly. Okay. And the, the type 2 diabetes <laughs> fact is understood. The key deficit is the too much insulin resistance, right? So the glucose 
So it should go into the cell, but it's sitting outside in the blood. So we see it as a high blood sugar. Right. And the question then is why? Why do you get this insulin resistance? And this is the uh, key question because if you don't understand why you get this insulin resistance, you have no hope of treating it. Okay. So under the current model, the way we now think, currently think about insulin resistance is that it's like a gate, right? So mm-hmm. the cell is like, you know, is a gated community. The glucose is outside. When insulin comes along, it's like a key that opens up this gate mm-hmm. and the glucose kind of goes into the cell mm-hmm. and that's it, right? When right. insulin falls, right, then the gate closes again, the glucose can't go in. So what they say is that it's kind of like the key and the lock now don't fit for some reason. Mm-hmm. So the glucose can't go in. So because the glucose can't mm-hmm. go into the cell, the cell is in a state of internal starvation is what they say. Not enough is going in, it's actually piling outside the blood. And that's why we as physicians give, for example, insulin or drugs that stimulate insulin such as sulfonylureas and so on. So what the idea is is that insulin is no longer working so well, so we kind of increase the insulin to really force this in, right? So you you really just uh, kind of by brute force shove this glucose into the cell. And that's what we think is really good for you. Um, Unfortunately, if you look at the past 25 years, that hasn't worked out because even as we've treated people, diabetics, uh, with insulin, with these drugs that stimulate insulin, the blood glucose has gotten better by shoving more sugar into, more of the glucose into the cell, but it hasn't stopped all the complications. So the eye disease, the kidney disease, heart attacks, the strokes, the nerve damage, all of that has Mm -hmm. not gotten better. And that's what we've proven in our studies from a few years ago. And I think the other thing that's interesting is that there is a paradox in uh, insulin sensitivity, the insulin resistance. So what people are saying is that insulin actually has two jobs. So not only does it move the glucose into the cell, the other job of insulin is now to take that glucose, and if there's too much, to turn it into fat. Because mm-hmm. remember, fat is a storage form of food energy. Absolutely. So insulin, which goes up when eating, is trying to move food energy into stored energy so that you can use it later on, right? So it does that by letting the body use the glucose, and then it turns that glucose into fat, which is a storage form. I think that's so, a key, a really key point for people um, that have that connection between excess weight and also like excess carbohydrates. Um, it's very hard for people to make that connection that carbohydrates, glucose can be stored as fat and that that's the key role that insulin plays in that whole mechanism. Exactly. It's something that's really, really important to be able to understand that and that's kind of at the base of, you know, solving and understanding that whole process, I feel. So that's a great, you know, great thing to keep in mind. Exactly. So, so the paradox was this. If you think that it's a problem with insulin, uh, the, the lock and key model, then what you should say is that, well, the glucose piles up outside the blood. Sure, we see that. But then you're not going to turn the glucose in the cell into fat. So you should see a lot less new fat being produced by the liver. But that's not what you see at all. What you see is a ton of fat, like all this excess fat that gets exported out of the liver and by, as triglycerides. It gets into the organs. It gets mm-hmm. turns into belly fat. Mm-hmm. So at the same time that you're saying that – so remember, insulin's job is to, one, move glucose into the cell. It looks like it's not doing that. But the other job of insulin is to turn glucose into fat. So it looks like it's doing a lot of that. Right. So this is the paradox. And people said, oh, I don't understand. Well, they're looking at it the wrong way. Mm -hmm. The thing is that you can't have in the very same cell one effect of the glucose that you say that's insulin resistant, but Mm -hmm. the other effect of making new fat, it's super sensitive. So on the one hand, it's resistant. On the other hand, it's super sensitive. Well, how does that even make sense? It's the same cell. Mm -hmm. It's the same insulin. It's the same everything. But that doesn't make sense. It's contradiction. you have to understand is that what insulin resistance is much better understood as a overflow phenomenon. So if you think about the uh, glucose in a cell and you think about the, the cell sort of like a train, for example. Mm-hmm. So if you uh, have insulin, then the train doors open and the passengers get on. So that's the normal situation. Doors open, the passengers get on, no problem. 
But what if that train is now just full of passengers from the previous stop, right? It's totally, completely full. In fact, it's overflowing with people. So all of a sudden, insulin comes, it, it opens the door, but the glucose can't get in. So the glucose is piling up outside the blood. So you see that you'd say, wow, glucose is piling outside in the blood. The, the right. cell is insulin resistant. It's resistant to the effect of insulin because it's already full. Right. Not because the insulin isn't doing its job. It's because the cell is already full. Mm -hmm. And that's a much more useful understanding because then you can understand why that, that the fat production goes Oh. very high because yeah. the cell is trying to get rid of all this excess glucose mm -hmm. by pushing it out storing, as fat. So storing, that's storing, called, yes. Yeah, exactly. That's called de novo lipogenesis. Mm -hmm. That's where you take sugar into fat. So the, yeah. the, the, the liver is busy pumping out as much fat as it possibly can. Mm -hmm. At the same time, it's not able to take the glucose because it's just full already. So that explains the whole paradox. And it really explains how we've been treating all the type 2 diabetics incorrectly mm -hmm. because really at its very core now what you say is that the 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 type 2 diabetes the insulin resistance is an overflow phenomenon so think of our body as a bowl of sugar for example mm -hmm. so if that bowl of sugar is full what happens when you eat is that the sugar comes in and then it spills out into the blood because mm -hmm. it's full right but the insulin instead of getting rid of the sugar, it doesn't do that. It takes that sugar and it simply crams it back into the body. Yes. Just like you're using this insulin to shove all those passengers inside. Into the train. And you're just cramming it into the yeah. body. The body says, oh, what am I going to do with it? It turns it into more fat. So then you get more fat production, people gain weight. And we know that on insulin. Because we got the body's got to do something with all that sugar. And, exactly. Uh, that brings me to a kind of question that I didn't think about before, but I would like to kind of squeeze it in at this point real quick before we go on. And like, how do you think that, is that related to metabolic function, like to the ability of the body itself, the individual body to burn energy and sugar and fat both for energy? Do you think that relates, you know, from because we see that from one person to the other that happens in different ways and i know that there are different factors at play here there is genetic predisposition you know there is definitely you know one of the main ones as we'll get to in a second is dietary factors yeah. but do you think how do you think metabolism and like the ability of the body to burn uh that energy relates to this process here so to explain the question better, like what I see in practice is that for some patients, they seem to have a much easier time, like using the glucose up that is put into the body, like on a compare comparative amount of calories. Some people seem to be able to burn those calories and some people, they go straight into fat storage. Absolutely. So that, that's the key problem, right? So if you have too much insulin resistance, your cell is full of glucose, and mm -hmm. what the body does is it increases the amount of insulin to try and shove more in, mm -hmm. right? So over time, what happens is that you get very high levels of insulin developing. So now what happens is that, remember, insulin is trying to shove the glucose into the cell. Mm -hmm. So as soon as you get any kind of glucose, that high insulin level is going to start shoving it into the cells, mm -hmm. into storage. Mm -hmm. That is, you can't burn it because mm -hmm. you're trying to store it. That right. signal to keep storing energy, to build fat stores, is always exactly. there. Right. So if you take 2,000 calories of food, for mm -hmm. example, and your body immediately tries to shove like 1,800 into fat stores, you have no energy to burn because yeah. you only have 200 left. So you go and get some more or you do what or your metabolism ramps down because you simply mm -hmm. have energy but the problem initially is the too much insulin yeah. right and that's the key to that, understanding it totally makes sense to me yeah that's a it's a great explanation just connecting those dots and like just you know getting a better picture of the whole situation because how that influences everything and how it influences like the fact that some people are always hungry yeah. And, you know, you do eat your calories and that should be efficiently burned. But because of the, you know, high insulin levels, that just goes straight to storage. And that yeah. what happens, your hunger is triggered. 
and you Absolutely. need more energy and then they're always tired as well because you're, you're constantly running on low fuel because your body is too busy putting everything into fat storage and yeah and i that's see the, that a lot yeah absolutely and that's the key to understanding right so the whole point is that what the underlying trigger of all this is is too many carbohydrates and too much insulin right so if you understand that that's really the the root cause of the entire disease mm -hmm. then the solution becomes relatively obvious well if it's too much insulin and too much sugar then lower the sugar and lower the insulin but that's not what we do in practice, what we do is we increase the insulin, which is the exact wrong thing to do. In fact, you're going to make it worse. Yeah. And that's what happens. So if you look at people with diabetes, they start with one medication. A couple of years later, they go to a second medication, yep. a third, then insulin, then yep. more insulin, more insulin. More insulin, more and insulin. And over a span of 10 years, their, their diabetes has done nothing but get, get worse yeah. because they didn't understand that the root cause was too much insulin. So that's exactly the problem, right? So if there's too much insulin... That's the core problem, too much insulin, too much glucose. But that's not what we do when we treat patients, we just give them more insulin. So what's gonna happen is that over time, things are gonna get worse. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what we see in clinical practice. So yeah. it, when people develop diabetes, they start with one medication, then two, then three, then four, then insulin, then more insulin, then more insulin. So over a period of 15 years, their diabetes has done nothing but get worse because you never really address the underlying cause. People don't understand what causes insulin resistance, so they just treat the high blood glucose by shoving it into the cells, mm -hmm. right? So what happens over time is that the body takes it, right? It takes the glucose and it fills up. So eventually the body fills up to the point that, you know, even using some medication, it can't go in. Right. So what do they do? They give you double the dose. They give you a second medication, a third medication, really force that glucose in. Yeah. Right? And the problem is that the glucose goes everywhere in your body, right? It goes into your eyes, goes into your kidneys, heart, into your nerves, and every part of your body just starts to rot. And that's what happens, right? So this is why the disease of type 2 diabetes, unlike virtually any other disease that we see, mm -hmm. affects everything, right? You get skin problems, you get you know blindness, you get dialysis, you get heart attacks, you get strokes, you get Alzheimer's disease, yeah. you get uh, nerve damage, you get... Yeah foot ulcers, you get infections, you get everything because your whole body is just so full of sugar. So if you understand that, then the solution is obvious. Mm -hmm. If it's too much sugar and too much insulin, then lower the sugar and lower the insulin. And there's only two ways to do that, right? Mm -hmm. If you want to get rid of the sugar, one, you need to stop putting it in, right? And that's why we use low carbohydrate diets, right? Because if you're adding a lot of sugar into your body, it's just going to be hard to get rid of it all. So that's the first thing, and some people do very well with that. But mm -hmm. if you've so far gone that you're just you're you know you have so much sugar that that's not going to work, then you need to burn it off, and that's it. So intermittent fasting is what we use mm -hmm. for that. Because you don't eat, your body is forced to burn that sugar. Yeah. And if you think about that sugar bowl, the sugar bowl is full. If you fast, what you're doing is you're forcing that body to burn down that sugar, and as it goes down and down and down and down. The next time you eat, the sugar goes in and doesn't spill out into the blood anymore. Mm -hmm. You have to understand that the insulin resistance was overflow is too much glucose, right? And this is the problem. We know that there's too much glucose, too much insulin. You can't treat it with more insulin. More insulin. Right? It's like putting exactly. gasoline on the fire. Exactly. And trying to put it out with the gasoline. Exactly. And that's what we've done. And yeah. that's a fundamental error that we've made. And mm -hmm. that's why nobody gets better. So... In our clinic, we do a lot of this low-carbohydrate diets and fasting, mm -hmm. and people do amazing. Like, uh, they, their diabetes goes away. And they say, you know, just this morning I saw somebody on, like, uh, 120 units of insulin and now on zero. And it's like, well, because we understood that you have to burn off all that sugar. And the best part is that it's all natural, right? Mm -hmm. We're not giving drugs. We're not yeah. doing surgery. We're not doing anything experimental. We're actually taking away the drugs. Exactly. We're trying to take away the drugs. It's a completely natural solution. Yes. And it has no cost associated with it. If you don't eat, you don't have to buy food. You're going to save yourself money. You're going to save yourself time. So the solution which has been used for thousands of years, right, by every religious group in the world, right? Mm -hmm. 
whether you're talking fasting, you know, Ramadan, uh, you know, in the Muslim faith, whether you're talking Buddhism, whether you're talking Hinduism, whether you're talking Christianity, whether you're talking Mormons, everybody was prescribed these periods of fasting, mm -hmm. right? And they understood it as a method of cleaning out the body. And truly it does that because what you're doing is you're cleaning out that extra glucose that is toxic. It's not that glucose itself is toxic, it's that it's too much the amount. glucose. Yeah. Right. Exactly. So um, let me ask you something that I know it's going to be very, very interesting for our listeners. And I really want to give them like, you know, a, a good expectation about how this works because uh, sometimes my patients get really... Um, impatience let's say <laughs> but this is a process that takes time right and what do you think is a reasonable um, time frame for expecting a, a very high level of insulin resistance to reset itself to kind of a normal level like are we talking weeks are we talking months are we talking years what is your experience in your practice well it usually depends on how long so if you've had the insulin resistance for 10, 15 years, it's not going to go away in two months, right? But if you have just developed the disease, then yes, it may take a little bit of time. Again, you can understand it when you think about your body blowing up like a balloon, right? Mm -hmm. your, your body is filling up with sugar, right? Mm -hmm. If you've been filling up your body with sugar for 20 years, it's going to take a lot longer to clean it out, yeah. right? But if... You're you're you just again you're just getting a little bit too much. Then you can clean it out pretty easy, and the diabetes goes away very quickly. So it really depends on how much uh, sugar is in your body, really how long you've had it, your age, and so on. And that's why the, the children generally just I mean up until recently don't get a lot of insulin resistance type two diabetes. It was always considered a disease of adults because it takes time to fill up our bodies with too much sugar. Right? It's not that there's some mysterious boogeyman that's causing insulin resistance. That was the whole problem with this other uh, lock and key model. Yeah. Well, what's causing the lock and key to malfunction? And they had all these answers, oxidative stress and inflammation and this and that and this and that, but it doesn't make any sense because you're still just guessing, right? When they say inflammation or oxidative stress, it means we don't know, right? You might as well say bad spirits, right? Evil spirits are doing it, right? That's the level of guessing you're talking about, right? So if you say, well, it's due to uh, inflammation, it's like, well, that's not helpful, right? Because no. if you get inflammation, and a lot of people do, they say, then give an anti-inflammatory such as ibuprofen, mm -hmm. that's an anti-inflammatory. Does it get better? No, not at all. So if you have a true inflammatory disease, such as arthritis, mm -hmm. and you have an anti-inflammatory, it does get better, right? Mm -hmm. Or prednisone, for example, which is a corticosteroid. If you have rheumatoid arthritis, which is actually an inflammatory disease, it does get better. Prednisone will make it better, right? But if you give prednisone to um, a diabetic, it gets much worse, right? So it's not an inflammatory disease. And all these other guesses, oh, it's the gut microbiome, oh, it's this, so oh, it's this, it's this. It's like, well... If you think it's that, then change it and see what happens. It doesn't get better, it's right? It's kind of like but ignoring it, the elephant in the room, you know? Exactly. It's like the answer is so clear and so immediate. And I was like, why are you going to look like in Italy, we say for the hair inside the egg, you know, it yeah. doesn't translate well into English, but, you know, you're looking for these really complicated answers when it's like kind of screaming in your face, like... <laughs> Exactly. That's exactly right. Because you're looking for something and you're making it much more complicated than it really needs to be. Because you're, you're saying that the in, uh, insulin resistance is the main problem, but what causes the insulin resistance, then you say, oh, evil spirits, right? Uh, okay, well, you got to come up with something better than that. If I say it's too much glucose and too much insulin, then I say, okay, well, if you lower. think that it's too much glucose, too much insulin, mm -hmm. then lower the glucose, lower the insulin by fasting. Does the diabetes get better? And yes, it does in virtually every single case, so which is not hard to understand, right? I mean, if you don't eat, your blood sugar will come down. You would think. Um, so I just want to um, make like a little point here about what you just said and, you know, just reiterate it for everybody. So it resetting insulin resistance doesn't happen overnight. And the longer you've had it, the longer it's going to take. So it's not something that happens in a matter of weeks. 
it happens in months, sometimes years, but it does happen. And, you know, I've seen it in my practice, Dr. Fang sees it in his practice every day. It happens with patients and sticking to a certain program. And part of that program is eating low carb. I use a therapeutic ketogenic diet, which is specifically addressed for that purpose. And I'm sure you use a very similar diet and you use fasting. So I would like to get a little bit into the topic of fasting because I have been using also fasting and we did have some communication. You kind of mentored me on that. It was about a year and a half ago, I think, right? When I reached out to you and um, about a certain patient and we did work with the fasting and it did work amazingly for her. And she actually went from like 140 units of insulin a day to zero. So it was great. Got off all her medications, lost almost 100 pounds. And, you know, and I've been using fasting more and more in different patients. But um, can you specify like a little bit better for our listeners how you use fasting? Do you use intermittent fasting, meaning like, you know, 17 hours um, like of fasting or an 18 hour or an eight hour eating window? Or do you use prolonged um, days of fasting and which model works better in your practice and what do you think is the difference between the two models of like just doing a daily short fast versus like an extended fast of like minimum three four days or longer yeah i think both work so the underlying physiology is very similar obviously so what but if you do it for twice as long, you probably get twice as good an effect, right? And that's why I think both models work very well. And there's there's plenty of good data with uh, something such as alternate daily fasting. There's some good data with that showing that you get very good weight loss with that, for example. Mm -hmm. And you get the same with extended fast as well when you go five days, seven days. So it's really a matter of personal preference. The longer the fast, the better the effect, right? Mm -hmm. Because what happens, of course, is you're forcing the, the, the body to burn down the glucose. Well, if you do alternate days, it goes down and then back up and then down and then back up. So you make slow steps, right? Two steps forward, one step back, two steps forward, one step back. You still make process, mm -hmm. progress. But if you do extended fasting every day, it's a step down, step down, step down. So it's better, but the risk is higher, right? So we do it, but we do it under uh, medical supervision and we have somebody to call and uh, we, we, we have experience with it, we monitor the blood work, so there, there's a different setup. Uh, so I do, I do more extended fasting for people who have more uh, severe insulin resistance. So that's basically it, right? If, if you took 30 years to get to the point where you're at now, and you're on 100 units of insulin, yeah. um, I, don't, I can't take 30 years to get you back down, right? It's, it's too long. So I have to do much more extensive fasting mm -hmm. to catch up in essence, and get rid of all that glucose. So I will use extended fasting periods, but again, there's there's risks, right? You're, you've got to adjust the medications very closely. Mm -hmm. You've got to make sure you're avoiding the, both the high sugars and the low sugars because I remember you're using the insulin to keep all that sugar bottled up in your body. Mm -hmm. As soon as you start mm -hmm. eating less, it may come out. If it comes out too fast quickly, your blood sugar will go very high. Yeah. If it comes out too slowly, your blood sugars will go very low. Both are dangerous, right? Especially yeah. the lows. So those, those are some of the risks of doing a longer fast. But what do you think, it, sorry to interrupt you, Dr. Fung, what do you think, um, what I do in my practice, I use keto adaptation to prevent some of those problems. So what I do is I put my patients through a whole phase of keto adaptation where their body become less dependent on the sugar and more dependent on burning fats. And when I feel like they have reached the state where we did the physiological adaptations necessary to maximize the fat burning ability of the body, then I start putting them on fasts. So I think it, it's it kind of sets yeah. them up for like an easier experience and at the same time like, you know, to really maximize the opportunity to burn the fat for energy that, you know, all that stored fat the insulin has put in there. Exactly. I think that makes perfect sense because all those people who are uh, kind of low-carb, high-fat or ketogenic diets, they adapt to the fasting very quickly because their body is already used to burning fat, right? Exactly. If you're not, it's it's a tougher transition, but mm -hmm. you can still get there. So yeah. I think that makes perfect sense in terms of uh, what we do. 
So, Dr. Fung, I have one more question for you, and that's something that I have seen um, in my clinical practice. And, you know, because I am not a doctor, just a nutritionist, I don't really have a physiological, like, scientific explanation for this, but I see it really clearly over and over again, and is that people who have adrenal fatigue they don't do well with like the daily intermittent fasting at all. It actually raises their blood sugars and it doesn't help them lose weight and it just doesn't seem to work. And the same people with adrenal fatigue, if I put them on a three to five day fast, and I usually do a broth fast, so they do get electrolytes and a little bit of nutrition, but they do really well with that, and they seem to unlock their plateaus of weight loss, and they, you know, after the first day or two, that they, they might have a little bit of a hard time, you know, hungry, like, you know, then they just get full of energy and they do great. But when I put them on that eight hour, 14 hour on and off, you know, daily intermittent fasting, it just totally goes, you know, makes their adrenal problems worse and they don't lose weight and the blood sugars goes up. So do you have any idea of like why that would happen? Well, the hormonal changes of prolonged fasting are actually quite different. So they may mm -hmm. benefit from the longer fast. So if you look at what happens during fasting, you know, obviously most of the effect we look at is the glucose, the insulin, but there are other changes. So if you look at growth hormone, if you look at cortisol, if you look at noradrenaline, mm -hmm. so those are all adrenal um, hormones, right? Yes. They take a little bit longer, but they go up, right? Mm -hmm. But it takes off in a few days, right? Yes. Two, three days. So what happens if you look at, say, growth hormone and noradrenaline? Mm -hmm. It's, it steadily goes up over time, mm -hmm. where as if you limit yourself to 18 hours or 24 hours of fasting, there's really no change. Mm -hmm. So you've got that same sort of low energy uh, state. But what happens is that as you start to switch over into the longer fast, you really start to deplete the body of the glucose, then what happens is that you're basically unlocking all the energy of the fat stores and the adrenal fatigue, so to speak, is just that you're not producing a lot of these adrenal hormones, mm -hmm. but fasting is actually a stimulus to produce more cortisol, which is not, it's not always a good thing, right? But in some people it is. Um, the cortisol is a stress hormone, and some yeah. people are actually too high, and they actually find the fasting not so good for them. So that's where some experience is helpful. Those people will cut them back to the shorter ones, right? Because they'll do better if they're kind yeah. of too much cortisol. But if they're low, kind of in the noradrenaline and cortisol, these adrenal hormones go up. But the, the shorter fasts won't do it very much, right? Mm -hmm. they, they barely not a budget at all, whereas the longer ones do very well. So again, you have to you know kind of understand it and be able to say, well, let's try this, let's try this. Most of the time, we actually you know, talk to people, right? We don't measure hormones because they fluctuate quite a bit. The key is to talk to people. Some people feel like very well and do very well with shorter fasts and some people don't. If you don't, then don't do it, right? I'm not that exactly. interested in, you know, trying to prove myself right. I'm interested in getting good results. So if you don't do well with short fasts, don't do that. Do the longer fast. If you don't do well with longer fast, don't do them. Absolutely. Go back to the shorter ones. And if the fasting doesn't work for you at all, then try something else, right? You can use low carbohydrate, ketogenic diets, low carb, high fat diets. You can do, uh, you know, many kinds of things or even, you know, sticking to real foods, paleo diets, for mm -hmm. example. So yeah, if you want to eat carbs, but kind of unrefined whole foods, yeah, some people do extremely well with that, right? Right. right. So there, there is no, um, you know, kind of one size fits, fits all. all here. You really have to talk Absolutely. to people. Absolutely. And try it, and and this is the whole thing, right? Um, it, it's 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 not like some people like chocolate ice cream and some people like vanilla ice cream, right? It, nobody's wrong, right? You right. can't say, well, I like chocolate ice cream, so you must like chocolate ice cream. That doesn't work like that, right? So the thing is that why would I? If this person does well with one therapy and this person does well with one therapy, then each person should do the therapy that does the best. Don't take this therapy, which might be a, you know, a ketogenic diet, and apply to this guy and say, you should get the same results. He may or may not, right? On the same time, this person likes to do whole foods and, you know, unrefined carbohydrates, mm -hmm. and it's very well. Yeah. Then I don't care. He does well. He should do it. 
don't take this therapy and apply it to this guy, right? And don't take this therapy and apply it to this guy. So you really have to have some kind of flexibility and say, well, you know, if things are um, doing well, then keep doing them. If they're not doing well, don't do them. But what, what fasting is, is a therapeutic option, right? Yes. It's a tool in our tool belt. You can't throw away this tool and say nobody should use it. It's very powerful. It's probably the most powerful tool there. I agree. So you need to use it. But it doesn't mean that everybody has to do it the same way or wants to do it the same way or even wants to do it at all. You don't have to. It's a tool. It's an option. Mm -hmm. It's there for you to use. It doesn't mean you use that hammer for every single problem that comes up in the house, right? Oh, your your light bulb is broken. Use the hammer, right? (laughs) Like, okay, well, that doesn't work. But if you have a nail that needs to be pounded in, yes, that hammer will work very well. So it's a tool, and, and, and let's not forget that that's what it is. So we can apply it, we can change it, we can do whatever we want with it, but everybody's different, right? And and, and, and we all know this to, to some degree, yet mm-hmm. it's crazy because some of the nutrition debates that go on are saying that, yes, this hammer should work for every situation, for every person. <laughs> doesn't work that way right get in the real world start working or calorie restriction it should work for everybody all the time no it shouldn't it does not well first of all all. i know (laughs) that's a very very poor tool but on the same time some people have done well with it so you can't totally discount that yeah there are people who do well with it if you do well with it great go ahead do it Mm -hmm. i don't really care if you're doing well i don't care what you're doing if you're not doing well let's change it to find what works for you and yeah, and find yeah. something. And for me, I find that fasting works for many people. If you don't yes. eat, you'll lose weight. That's the bottom line. So if that's true, then what's wrong with that? Why can't we do that, right? And there's actually no reason. No, it's a, and it's a, it's a great tool. I like it a lot because it brings a lot of added benefits. And, you know, not just the one that we talked about, about the in, resetting insulin sensitivity and lowering glucose. I feel like it's a great detoxing tool as well. And, um, you know, that's what it was originally kind of used for before all these sugar problems existed, right? Back in the days when people didn't eat so much sugar, you know, it was a detoxing tool. And it's still a really important one. And, you know, let me not get in this tangent of detoxing because I can talk to you for hours about it. But Mm -hmm. yeah, I, um, I think it's an excellent tool. And I completely agree with you because I am 100% on the same page as far as There is no approach like one size fits all when it comes to individual health. And I come from a very holistic health approach, you know, less of the medical, more of the holistic, more, you know, kind of nature based approach, less on the medical, you know, um, medicine based. But still, like, you have to be really, um, really with your eyes open, aware, and ready to see what is going on with the individual patient in order to provide the solutions that work for that patient. Because I feel like a lot of doctors, especially medical doctors, do not have that openness and they demand kind of of the body that it fits like, you know, like the famous square peg in a round hole. Mm -hmm. And they want to shove their patients in those holes that don't fit them. While it's really important to have you know, that openness to see what the patient really needs. And that's why I appreciate your work so much, Dr. Funk, because, you know, it's not every doctor that is able to do that. And that's quite amazing that you bring that, you know, your clinical expertise, your medical expertise together with that openness. And, you know, that brings a really successful recipe. And so thank you so much for your work. I, I think I'm done grilling you for today. (laughs) It was such a pleasure talking with you. And I I will, I have like so many more things. I think we'll definitely, would love to do another interview with you at some point and dig out some more of that knowledge that you hold. (laughs) But I think this will be extremely helpful for a lot of my patients and my, my readers, my listeners. And um, please, you guys that are listening, go check out Dr. Funk's book, The Obesity Code. I think that it will be a great resource for anybody that's interested in these topics. And you'll find much, much more in there. And also, he writes amazing blog posts that, you know, I read all the time. I don't read a lot of blogs because I have very little time. But Dr. Funk's blog is one of my favorites. (laughs) 
So well, thank we, you very much. We great. can thank him for some of my knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. And uh, we hopefully will talk to you soon. Okay. Thank you. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.